On the third day when the morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and a large trumpet sound, so that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke, because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and he went up. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, you're not going to go to sleep with Mike leading, so. Thank you. Very good. All right. So we've been talking about holy last week, and maybe this is an odd title, but we want to talk about being dangerously holy. I'm not sure I've ever seen that together before, but there are some stories that you get from the Old Testament that just seem to really fit that. I mean, usually when we think of something that's dangerously holy, we think, you know, God is great and holy, and we are terrible sinners, and He's about to send us to hell or someplace worse, and that's our picture. That's what we think about is, yes, it's going to be awful, and so he's holy, and we're in danger. What if you're on the same side? Can God be dangerously holy for his people who are on the same side? I want you to just think about that. What is danger? What do you think of as danger? Of course, this looks a little dangerous to me. Uh, You might think dangerous was when the kids are running around on the stage up here after church. That might be a little dangerous as well. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to be trying this. The world's hardest hike. You guys think I go on hard hikes? This is in China, recognized as the world's hardest hike. Um, And by the way, they are on trail. So, that's where it's supposed to go. Does not seem possible, does it? And this is a person just taking a photograph, but be careful where you stand if you're trying to take a picture of lava. Uh, Yeah, you do have to be careful on something. So, those are some things we might recognize that are dangerous a little bit. And we don't really want to be in a position where we're with God and... And he's talking about danger, but anytime you're trying to handle that much power, if you're trying to photograph a volcano, you might need to be aware of the power of the volcano, and we might need to be aware of the power of God that we have. And so when we think about a dangerous God or dangerously holy, God is holy. And evil can be around him, and he's able to talk to Satan. In the book of Job, we see where God talks to Satan, but it's Satan who's come to visit God. It's not God going to visit him. And so, yeah, God can be around evil. We say, you know, evil can't be around God is more the term for it, because when God and evil come together, one of them's running away. And it isn't God who's running away. It isn't God who's refusing to go to a place. God can go anywhere he wants to go. But evil's going to run away from God. And I think we need to recognize that and realize that that's who God is. The story we want to pick up today is where God comes to meet Israel on Sinai. And so he has brought them out. Moses has been able to bring the people across the Red Sea. And they've come all the way to Mount Sinai. And they stand there before the mountain, and God is going to meet them there. And this is one of those times where he had promised Moses that you can come back here. This is a sign for you. And sure enough, now they're here. And he's brought all of Israel with him. And he brings them there to meet God, to be able to get the law of God. And so all the commandments that are going to be there are in this place. And so he has led them to this place by promise of God, and he decides he is going to come down on the mountain, and when God decides to make an entrance, God knows how to make an entrance. I thought about 
getting Rich to put in Dolby sound so that we could just kind of shake the place a little bit during the sermon this morning, but it seemed like kind of short notice. I'm sure if he had two weeks, he could pull it off. But God comes down in a thick cloud, and yes, this is for effect, and I wish we really had this. And he warns them, I don't want you to come near the mountain because I'm about to come down on that mountain. And uh, you don't want to be standing anywhere close to that mountain. And so when God decides he's going to come down, there's thunder, there's lightning, and God is there with the smoke on the mountain. The mountain is just, it's incredible. I don't know what it would be like, and certainly the pictures don't do it justice. And the whole mountain shakes, there's an earthquake, and not only is the mountain shaking, but it seems like the ground underneath is shaking, and Moses brings the people out to meet God. I mean, what an incredible sight. And Moses speaks, and God answers in thunder. Yeah, I couldn't get wretched to set that up either. And it's be careful, don't let them break out and come up to the mountain because they'll die. I mean, you just, you're gone. And at the same time, maintain that distance because I don't want to break out against them because I'm a holy God. And if you come to me unprepared, you should be, you should be careful because you're going to realize the risk. And it is to impress them. It is to show them what a holy God is like and the difference between them and where God actually is. It's it's like losing a blowtorch or a flamethrower to light a candle. I mean, the wax is going to be completely gone by the time you get the wick lips. And so, you know, maybe it would be like using dynamite as a mousetrap. You know, put the cheese on, light it, hope the mouse comes. It's a little bit overkill, don't you think? But that's what it's like when you're trying to realize how great God is. And one of the greatest characteristics about God is his holiness. And so when God gives those ten commandments and speaks from the top of the mountain and those people hear those commandments, he wants to make sure that you heard him. And so all of this is so that you're able to realize God is talking to you. Be afraid. Because God will punish evil. And evil isn't able to be in the presence of God. But even his holy people and the people he is trying to bless, it makes us a little bit insecure and in being in the presence of God. And so it's just got to be one of those amazing things to realize that that's where we could sit, that that's where we could stand. And we're always impressed with the creation that God has made, but it's even more impressive when God comes down and says, let me show you what it'll do. Let me turn on the Dolby in this mountain. Let me give you the sound of what thunder's really like. And it's got to be so impressive. There is a sense and a theory that goes around that worship is all the time and certainly part of that's true because we're never out of the presence of God there's another sense in which we are not always in the presence of God and if you can maybe get the difference with both of those statements being true and both of those statements being untrue you can catch a glimpse of what this is because I think we need to show reverence for a holy God. And it isn't an all the time thing, but there is a special time when you come to meet God. And there are times of greater holiness and greater purity and greater devotion, which is what holiness is really all about. And it's not just about, oh yeah, God and I are best buds and we just hang out. You're not hanging out with this. This is a whole different thing. He says, when I have a conversation with you, I want you to pay attention. And you've got to realize what it is when we come to the presence of God. It's a little bit bigger than just getting a text from someone. When priests went to offer sacrifices, it was not an everyday thing. They had to wash They had to put on certain clothes. They would be able to go 
offer sacrifice only if they were from the tribe of Levi and high priests only from Aaron. He was the first high priest and only Aaron's sons after him would be high priest. He had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Ithmar, and Eliezer. And so those were the only ones who were going to be high priest. And so you realize the things that they would wear were specifically designed by God, given from the top of the mountain, and said, here is what I want you to wear. And so they have the white robe, the uh, blue one that is covering the ephod, then the breastplate, then the turban, then the, yeah, I can't remember the names, the platelets that are on the shoulders and the chain and the belt and the everything else in the bottom of the road had pomegranates and bells. And so it would always be making a sound every single time you walked and you did not go before God unless you were dressed like this. Because you were walking into the very presence in the Holy of Holies. It wasn't just a casual thing. Now today as we come to church, there's no required dress. You don't have to dress a certain way. And so there's not a required way in which you have to do that. I said that one time in a sermon and one of our newer converts who was... A lady about 50 took me literally, and the next Sunday she wore hot pants. She said, that's what I'm comfortable in. You said I could dress any way I wanted to. And I was like, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said it quite that way. But, uh, yeah. So please don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. But coming into the presence of God at that time and in those special occasions, yes, be careful what happens. Be careful how you are. Be careful the kind of heart that you would bring. And so as you look at all of this, you see Aaron, he goes to offer the sacrifice as, as we're looking at this. And so if you look at Leviticus 10... Leviticus 9, the very end of the chapter, Aaron has gone up to offer the burnt offering, and then he offers the people's offering, and then he offers the grain offering, and then the peace offering, and then the wave offering, and then as Aaron comes down, he goes into the tent of meeting, and then he comes out and he blesses the people, and we see the glory of the Lord appears to all the people. And the fire comes out from before the Lord and consumes the burnt offering. I mean, he's already offered them as offerings, but you know how it is when you do this. And then you get this effect and this campfire type thing of going on. And then the fire of God comes out. Okay. A few interruptions today. I know there's no sense in me trying to preach, and you guys are all watching that. So. so that was the normal way of doing it. And I think it might have been one of the first times that they saw this. And, I mean, it seems as if he had lit the sacrifice, and the sacrifice had been offered. But God is literally there in their presence. And the fire goes out from God and consumes. And the people yelled out and fell down. And cried out because they were not expecting fireworks in church. Another thing I couldn't get rich to do today. So, <laughs> I mean, that's just one of those things that's got to be a surprise and a shock that, that, okay. And God is accepting the sacrifice. And so it, he answers in, in fire. What an amazing thing to realize this and to see where he is and... The people shouted, and they're so shocked because they realize we are standing in the presence of God, and God responds in fire. And then in Leviticus 10, we get the story of Nadab and Abihu. And I want you to listen to the story because it is an important story to realize what's going on. And it, it's a, it is a whole story about what happens here. 
And so it says, Now Dadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And I don't know if you can get the sense of what's going on here or not. But Aaron has just come back. He's got all of that equipment on, all of that garb on. You only wear it in the presence of God. I mean, you don't wear it to parties or anything like that and it's not something that you do any other time but being in the presence of God and so right up behind him Nadab and Abihu come and they've got incense that they're about to offer now I'm not exactly sure and it isn't exactly clear what was supposed to happen with this incense that they are about to offer and so they come up, they've got the fire pan, then they got fire from somewhere, and they put the incense on, and they come up to be able to offer this incense, and their father's coming down. I don't know if he knew that they were there, if he knew what was coming, but the fire now comes out from the Lord and burns them up. Okay, I'd cry out again then. That's got to be huge when you look up and you see this wall of fire coming out enough to burn them to pieces. And Aaron is standing there as he watches his sons come. And he knows who his sons are. He knows what, what's going on with them. He knows they are not the most respectful children at all because he just knows that that's what's about them. And I don't know exactly what it is, the fire that was supposed to be taken and put into the fire pans to be able to offer this incense was fire from the altar. And apparently they had the fire before they're coming to the altar. It could also be a problem of timing because incense was to be offered in the morning and in the evening. And here they are, time of the evening sacrifice. And so maybe it's a problem of timing and they're not the ones who's supposed to be in there. And they're like, well, we want to take part of this too. So let's go get... and." It's a lack of respect for God. They're not treating God as holy. They're not treating their father as holy. They're not having any kind of respect for the God that their father serves as he stands there as high priest and all of this. And I don't know if you can catch what's going on because there's no respect for God and no respect for what he's commanded. And Moses speaks for God and he says, I will be treated as holy. I will be glorified. And here's the example as this fire comes out and burns these two guys up. And it's Aaron's sons as he stands there on the steps of the altar. And he's watching his sons be burned to death. And the tagline is, and Aaron held his peace. What in the world does that mean? That means Aaron is not free to do whatever he wants to. Aaron cannot move. Aaron cannot touch a dead body. Aaron cannot go to his sons. Aaron cannot do anything that is unholy. Aaron is wearing the priestly robes. Aaron has the anointing oil. Aaron is the guy who stands between Israel and God right now. He is that person and he cannot let go of either side. He is the priest of God and his sons have not honored him. His sons have had no respect for the God that he, that he serves. That's no respect for their father and God comes out against them. I'm sure they're not the only ones. But they're the ones standing there that completely disobeyed God. And they're just throwing this in God's face. And so his choice is rebellious sons are a holy God. And Aaron holds his peace. What would you choose? Rebellious sons are a holy God. If he had broken and gone to them, he would never 
be high priest or able to offer any sacrifice ever again. It's one of the tensest moments you see in the Bible. It says, And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron. Because remember, this can't just be anybody. And he said to them, Come near and carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. And so they came near and carried them in the coats out of the camp. And as Moses said, And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithmar, his sons, do not let a hair of your head hang loose and do not tear your clothes lest you die and wrath come upon all the congregation and let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning of the Lord that the Lord has kindled and do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting lest you die for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. So it can't be either one of them or any of them that would touch them because then they would be unclean and then all of Israel would be unclean and then the fire goes to everybody because this is the priest offering the sacrifice for them. He can't even go outside the camp where they are. He can't do anything or else he would be banned forever from any sacrifice. He can't go to their funeral. They carry him out with their coats all the way outside of the camp, not just out of the area, but completely outside of the camp because they are no longer to be part of that camp. He says, the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. It is serious. And I think sometimes we today treat it as if, oh, just God's everywhere and we're everywhere. And so everything is. No, when you come to worship God, there has to be a reverence and respect because he is dangerously holy. We need to know that. And one fire accepts Aaron's sacrifice and one fire destroys Nadab and Abihu. He is dangerously holy to people on his side who are his priests, who are serving him. It's not a scary thing. It's a a scary thing, if you understand. Because it isn't like he's trying to destroy you. It isn't like you've... It's just you need to pay attention to what's going on with God. And if you want a relationship with a holy God, there has to be some respect for him. To treat him like he is holy. And be willing to follow what it means to be holy. Because holy is dangerous for people who don't respect God. So what's the difference between regular and holy? Well, for them it's fairly easy to see. It's proximity to a holy God. So when are you closer to God? Well, do you need to be more careful in the church building? I don't know. What did you expect when you came? I think it might be more what happens inside of us. And if we came to approach a holy God on his terms and his ground, wherever that is, whether it's here or if it's in the place where you pray, Or if it's in the place where you talk to God and when you read scripture, be careful. You are in the presence of a holy God. We see this continued with Jesus when we look at the life of Jesus in Mark 5. You see one of those situations where he goes to the country of the Gerasenes. And there's a man who comes out from the country and the man is possessed with a legion of demons. And I just want you to realize what happens here. As he comes out, it says he lived among the tombs and no one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but had wrenched the chains apart. And he broke the shackles in pieces and no one had strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on, all the, and on the mountains he was away, crying out and cutting himself with stones." And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? 
I adjure you by God, do not torment me. That's a scary description just to begin with, isn't it? I mean, do you like a guy who lives in the cemetery and runs around naked screaming and hollering at night and and no, uh, they've tried to catch him and you cannot bind him with anything. Doesn't matter how big the chain is, he can break it apart. He is stronger than any group of men or any chain. And yet when Jesus walks in, this is a monster. They have their own personal monster who is there. But he's more of a monster to himself than he is to any one of them because the evil is destroying him. And when he sees Jesus far off, he runs and he falls down before him. Please don't torment me. Their monster is terrified of Jesus. Why? Because he's a holy God. The absolute worst evil has to throw at us is terrified in the presence of someone holy. Jesus completely subdues him, casts out the demons, leaves him in his right mind to be able to preach the gospel. That's a holy God. In Luke chapter 2, we see the story of the birth of Jesus. And it's a very simple few lines. They've gone to Bethlehem, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Is that the same one? Yeah, same one. Same one that fits in the arms of Mary. Holy God. Such a small package. If you listen for just a minute, they're going to make a sound. Because they can't stand it to be quiet. And if you ever get between a song or in a prayer, they've got to speak up. Can you imagine holy God being like that as he lays there in the arms of Mary asleep? It's hard to see his strength and his power and the fire that could come from him as he's completely dependent on Mary and we realize how small his hand that created a universe and all things and us is the same hand that can make demons fall down before him and tremble. And he's the one who causes demons to beg for mercy. They cannot be in his presence. And that's who we serve. In John chapter 1, as John begins to try to describe what Jesus is like, he says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, he believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The true light, yeah. It's amazing the way John describes this. It was coming into the world, and the world was made through him. Everything was created by him, but... Then he also describes the other side, the irreverence that you would see. The world didn't know him, didn't accept him. His people, his own people, didn't receive him. But there were some, some who believed that he was the Son of God, 
without smoke, without fire, in the presence as a human being, without all the other things, if you can imagine how much he must be holding back to appear to be just normally human. And some believe. There's no trumpet, there's no earthquake as he walks. There's no huge sound as he speaks, but his sound is so true. He gave them the right to become children of God. Born of God, not just natural birth. So what does it take to treat God as holy? Does it take the threat of death? Is that the only thing that's going to work for you? If I saw a mountain shake, especially superstitions, they would be great, right? Can you imagine fire down on the top of them? Those are impressive anyway. And then the fire on the top of them as you sit at the bottom saying, yeah, don't go up there. Maybe it's just the tornado. This week we've seen the devastation they can do. He gave us the right, the opportunity, the privilege to be children of God, people who are born again. Something as simple as water, that we could be buried in water, and something that simple as we repent of our sin, and they would allow us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that other part of God that's able to be here now, that we could be priests like Aaron. Do you need it the other way around? Would you rather have, you know, the big fire ceremony? Or is it okay if you just come and sit and realize, wherever I come to the presence of God, I need to treat him as holy. That's where I need to have respect for him. And there are times of that reverence that I need to have with God. And I hope you've come there this morning. And if ever you've not treated God, well then please fix that this morning. If you have not been baptized into Christ, if you have ignored him completely, if, if you have been one of the rebellious ones that said, no, I don't need anything from him. I hope you realize where you sit and it's the middle of this presence of a holy God who could come to you in fire this morning, but I'm kind of thankful he came in PowerPoint, aren't you? And he's in our song. And so Mike's going to lead us as we sing about holy ground. If you need to come, why don't you come? All right, let me figure out where I am. I can see it. I'm just trying to figure out where to go next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it breaks the chain, it kind of flops on the end, you know, and it's just one of those things that's hard to catch hold of again. <laughs>